Good morning. Last week we started a new 72 ounce sermon series in the book of Esther. And that beautiful artwork that you see on the screen was done by Claire Snow, who is our media coordinator. She designed and illustrated it herself. And one of the things I've learned about Claire is that she likes to put Easter eggs in her artwork, little hidden gems. So if you look closely at the background, at all of those points where the lines converge, there's a hidden star of David. It's a fitting portrayal of this story about a hidden girl and a hidden God. Esther hides her Jewish identity and God hides his presence because nowhere in this book does God speak and nowhere in this book is God even mentioned at all. So of course it would beg the question, is God even there? You know that question. Let's just be blunt level honest for a second. Your experience of God for the vast majority of your life is most likely one of existential absence. We don't walk around feeling the existential presence of God every day at the DMV or the drive-thru. We don't have Red Sea moments every week or have Walls of Jericho moments on the regular. What we do have, though, is questions. God, are you there? What are you doing? God, are you there as these earthly powers play their power games all around us? Are you there in all of these circumstances that I did not ask for? Are you there despite the bad choices I've made that make me afraid that maybe you're just done with me. God, where are you? And so my hope for you and for your life is that this series will be like learning about that star of David. That once God has pointed out to you, you realize he was there all along and at the very center of it all. Amen. Have you ever been invited on a six-month binger? In chapter one, we're given a long, slow, detailed look at the Persian Empire and all of its grandeur and its celebration of money, sex, and power. King Ahasuerus wanted to to parade his power and his wealth before his leaders and his officials. And it says that he wanted to display the riches of his glory and the splendor and pomp of his greatness. So he throws a 180-day party, a six-month binger with parades of his army and cattle and riches and wealth and opulence while they eat and drink day after day. He's a man with a high need for applause and adoration from others. And then when that was complete, he threw another seven-day party throughout the whole empire or throughout the whole city where everyone great and small was invited to come to the party where they could drink from golden goblets and have a -a once-in-a-lifetime chance to drink the king's wine. And there's only one rule at this party. The one rule is that there are no rules. Everyone is free of compulsion. Everyone can do whatever they want, with whoever they want, without consequence. This party made Mardi Gras look like a daycare. Can you imagine the excess, the debauchery, the darkness of all of the decisions that were made? and the lives that were destroyed in the process. 
It's no wonder the Jewish rabbis said Persia was where the devil himself danced. And then on the final night, after six months of partying, as you can expect, Ahasuerus is drunk. And he decides to display his most prized possession of all, his wife, his queen, Vashti. He calls for her to come and to exhibit her body and to parade her figure and her form before all of Ahasuerus' drinking buddies. Now, does any of this disturb you? Does it make you feel uncomfortable? It's supposed to. That's the point. But then surprisingly, when Ahasuerus calls for her, Vashti says, no. She refuses. Sorry, bro. And the king is enraged. How dare she defy him? How dare she defy the God-man? So he deposed her. And he removed the crown from her head and he banished her to a life of isolation and misery for daring to say no to him. And then the king treated his marriage problems like a national emergency. And then his advisors come to him and they say that he needed to replace Vashti and find a new queen. How so? They said he needed to do so by holding a beauty pageant. And so the way it worked was his officials collected the most beautiful virgins from all of the provinces, from Egypt to India. It's a lot. And brought them to the capital city where they would receive beauty treatments for one year. And then each of them would be given one chance to perform. They'd be given one night with the king to please and satisfy him. And whoever did so the most, well, she would be queen. Scholars estimate that this could have included up to 1,000 young virgins. Three years of one night stands. Are you disgusted yet? That's the point. We're supposed to be. That's why we're given this long, detailed, slow motion, car wreck view of this empire and all of its values. We're supposed to see what drives these halls of power and the system that they have built. And so up to this point, what does this system tell you about a man's value? It's in his wealth and power, and possessions. And up to this point, what does this system tell you about a woman's value? It's in her beauty, and her body, and her ability to please a man. Isn't it so nice things have changed? Now this is an old problem. It's an empire of excess, and debauchery, and greed, and lust, and injustice, and filth. So what's it showing us? It's showing us what the kingdoms of this world really look like. The beginning of Esther is about showing us the ultimate reality of what this world builds. This is really all you're going to get. Because this is what the world is going to produce on repeat Systems of power, spectacle, sex, objectification, and corruption. And so no matter how good it looks on the outside, this is what it looks like on the inside. Because behind all the kingdoms of this world is a snake, a dragon, a monster. And all this is simply the finest and fullest expression of what worldly values produce. And it's asking you, do you see it? And are you disgusted by it? 
And of course, we want to rise up and protest and point our finger, finger at such evil and excess. And that's good. The author wants us to feel that way, but then the script gets flipped on us. Because at the very center of all this, the winner of it all, the one who pleased the king the most, was a Jewish girl, Hadassah, Esther. When we see how grotesque this whole system was, but then we see Esther come out of it with the crown on her Jewish head. It forces a reaction, and it slams the question right in front of you, what do you think of Esther? What do you make of her in all of this? Esther's one of the most misunderstood and maligned figures in the Bible. Because the reactions to her essentially fall into one of three categories. Esther is either a victim, a coward, or a sellout. So Esther is a victim because some see how the text says that the virgins were gathered and that Esther was taken into the king's palace. And they base their interpretation on the fact that the passive voice is used. And so they say, see, she didn't have a choice. She's a powerless victim, forced to be a paper princess in the hands of powerful men. Others see Esther as a coward. She didn't put up a fight. She didn't have, a cur she didn't have the courage to resist. She just got dolled up. So for these people, Vashti is their hero. Esther should have been more like her, but instead she's just a princess, puppet, a slave to corrupt power, a paper princess that did whatever she was told and was complicit in the system. Others view Esther as a sellout, She's a Jew, but she hides her identity. She doesn't follow any dietary laws. She has a one-night stand with a man she's not married to, and then she marries a non-Jew in a pagan wedding that invoked pagan gods. Three massive prohibitions in the Torah. So why couldn't Esther be more like Daniel and not eat the king's food? Why couldn't she be more like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and stand up when everyone else bowed down? No, she's just a paper princess that gave in to worldly pleasure and wealth. She laid aside holiness and played the harlot. So what do you think of Esther? Interpretations are all over the place, aren't they? It seems we don't quite know what to do with her. And I think that is the point. The author gives you a very compromised and complicated bride where you don't know whether to feel sorry for her or disgusted by her. But there's two problems I have with those three interpretations on who and what Esther is. The first is that each of these interpretations places her in a simple category for their own ends. So if you want to speak against corrupt men, then she's a victim. If you want to speak against corrupt systems, then she's a coward. If you want to speak against corrupt Christians, then she's a sellout. Just take your pick. But all those interpretations are doing is treating Esther in the same exact way that the Persians did. They flatten her into a two-dimensional image and use her for their own ends. They only focus on what they want to do with her instead of what God is doing with her. And Esther is far from being so simple. But the second issue is that those interpretations completely divorce Esther from the rest of the Bible. 
They're narrow interpretations because they take a narrow view and they only see Esther in light of this moment in chapter 2 and they don't see her in light of this grand story of God. So to try and untangle all of this, let's ask a different question. What does God think of Esther? And you might think, well, how can we know? God doesn't speak anywhere in the book. And that's true. Much is made of that fact. But that's also a bit misleading because don't make the mistake of thinking that just because God doesn't speak, it means that he doesn't have anything to say. If we take a step back from this story for a second and just consider the scriptures as a whole, what is God doing when he slows down and gives us a story about a woman? Tamar. Sarah, Rahab, Deborah, the Levite's concubine, Hannah, Ruth, Bathsheba, Esther, Mary. Why are they there? We know the stories of men, the Moseses and the Davids, and as a general rule, They point to the person of Christ and the three offices that he holds as our Redeemer. But it's in the stories of these women that God is doing something special. It's in the stories of these women that God is hiding the dynamics of our redemption. It's in the stories of these women that God hides the blueprint for how he will redeem his people. It's in the stories of these women that God hides the battle plan for how our Redeemer will be victorious and will crush the head of the serpent. Where do I get that? Well, just go all the way back to the beginning in Genesis 3 when God tells the serpent, through the seed of the woman, I am going to crush your head. God is literally telling the serpent how he's going to destroy him. And so in each of these stories of these women, God is hiding a la- another layer of the blueprint of how redemption will be accomplished and how the serpent will be defeated so that whenever we finally get to Mary, both of those things come together. Our Redeemer finally comes, but he does so by literally hiding in the womb of a woman. And the powers of this world didn't see it coming. They were focused on the power of man and the halls of power and corrupting him and them, and they overlooked the woman. And that was the very avenue through which Christ entered into this world. It's why in the temptation Satan asked in his first two temptations, if you're really the son of God, He had his suspicions, but he had to make sure. And by the third temptation, he doesn't ask anymore. Now he knows. So he just puts a deal on the table. He's got a problem. God tricked the cosmic powers by hiding his battle plan in plain sight to make a mockery of the devil by using what this world despised to confound the wise. So what does this have to do with Esther? Everything. God is hiding the dynamics of our redemption in her story. But to see it, we have to take a bigger view. We have to see Esther beyond just this moment in chapter 2. And we have to see her place in the whole canon of Scripture. In the Jewish Old Testament or the Jewish scriptures, Esther is actually placed at the very end. It's how it ends. And that's really the best place, historically speaking. But if you think about it, that's also a haunting fact. Because that means that the Old Testament starts with God speaking and filling creation with goodness. But then it ends with so much evil and God not speaking at all. 
When we see it in that light, Esther stands at a turning point in the biblical story. She points backward to everything that came before her. Because we have to remember, why did Israel go into exile in the first place? In Deuteronomy this morning, it was read to you, you heard where God told Israel that if they rejected him and they disregarded his voice and he would send them into exile among the nations. And yet what did Israel do century after century? All Israel wanted was to be like the nations. They didn't want to be who God wanted them to be. So they didn't listen to his voice. They didn't treasure his words. And instead, they wanted to worship the gods of the nations. They wanted the kings like the nations. They wanted the power of the nations. Until, finally, God sends them into exile in the nations. And he says, if you want the nations, I will give them to you. And that puts Esther in a whole new light. Because seeing Esther swept up into the pomp and circumstance and power of the empire, to see the Jewish girl rise to the top and have favor and have the crown placed on her head, was this not what Israel wanted all along? Was this not everything they longed for? To be wedded to earthly power and to be like the nations and to have the favor and adoration of the nations. And so much gets made about God not speaking in Esther, and yet, in a sense, does God not stand back and say, have I not spoken for millennia? Did I not speak for centuries, inviting you into relationship with me? Did I not speak and teach you to live in a way that protected you from all of that evil that is out in the world, and yet you longed to be like the nations? And then when you finally get the nations, you realize that all they wanted to do was use you, abuse you, and kill you. So yes, God doesn't speak in Esther because he does not have to. This story is a fulfillment of everything that he's already said. Esther is the ultimate expression of Israel's desires. She represents everything that they always wanted. So when we see that, it helps us understand the complexity and complication and compromise and complicitness of her story. Yes, she's taken into the palace, but she also tries. Those prison bars became so comfortable in the midst of all those beauty treatments, all that luxury lulling her to sleep like sin always does. She learns to live inside of those circumstances because she's hardly passive when she slowly won favor. She listened to Haggai. She did exactly what she said, and she went into the king's chamber ready to conquer. Her life is a mix of things done to her and things that she has done. It's complicated, isn't it? Because Esther is simply the fullest expression of a complicated and compromised people. That's Israel from the very beginning. Israel didn't ask to be taken into slavery. And yet three days after the Red Sea, did they not long to return to Egypt? Because at least there they had onions. In Judges, they cry out for deliverance. And yet, did they not immediately return to bondage as soon as they possibly could? Solomon wanted God's blessing, but did he also not want an endless parade of bodies in his harem? You can point the finger at Esther. Esther represents what Israel always wanted. So we can point the finger at her, but all that does is overlook why she's there in the first place and who she represents. Esther stands at a turning point. She points backward to all that came before her, but she also points forward to all who come after her. She points forward to the church.
We have to notice that Esther is not an exile book. Exile implies returning home to the promised land, but not Esther. Esther is a diaspora book. There's no intention of ever returning home at all. In fact, these Jews already had their chance decades before. Why is that important? Because not long after this, there will no longer be a geographical center to this faith in Jerusalem. Jesus will come, the temple will be destroyed, and his people will no longer have a home in this world. His church will all be a diaspora people. Scattered across the face of this earth among the empires and the evil of this world. Where they too will be wronged by this world. And they will be pulled and influenced and compromised by the values of this world. And they'll have to learn to live in a foreign land that is not their true home. Esther's story is the story of the church. Esther's story is our story. Her complication is our complication. So the question isn't so much, what do you think of Esther? The real question is, do you realize that Esther is you? Are we any less complicated and compromised by the world's values? Do you try to fit in at work, selling your soul a little bit because it might help your career advance and get the attention of the right people? If you're looking for a spouse, do you start with looks? Do you undergo the beauty treatments of this world because you're obsessed with what you look like on the outside and how others will see you? Do you hate your addiction and yet at the same time it feels so comfortable and soothing? Do you search online for an endless parade of bodies to dance before you and get angry at the thought of it being taken away and not having it? Have you ignored God's voice? Are we any less compromised? And honestly, are we any less complicated? Friend, there is so much that's happened in your life. Can you really be put into a simple category? You've been wronged and victimized in ways that you didn't ask for. But maybe the ways you've responded to it all haven't made it any better. You hate the sin and the brokenness in your life, but at the same time, it makes you feel so comfortable and you can't let it go. You feel like like you have to hide who you really are. You have to perform and dance for the surrounding world or else you'll be rejected. And your life just feels so inauthentic. Or your life is just a continuation of the broken patterns in your family. And you feel like another casualty in an endless line of generational sin destined for failure. You feel like your life is just a tangled mess. You don't know where to start to try and unravel it. And all the while you're surrounded by a world of greed, lust, excess, and power that promises to give you place and status and privilege if you would just listen. And in the midst of it all, God just feels like he is so hidden. Like he was there once. But not anymore because he's done with you and he's so disappointed in you. He feels so hidden behind the circumstances of life and will only appear when you get it all figured out and yet you feel so incapable of doing that. And so of course we turn to the things of this world when we feel like it's as good as we're going to get, and we wonder, God, where are you? 
And what are you doing? What becomes of Esther? What does God do with her? As we end chapter 2, Esther has the crown on her head as the queen of this world, as this complicated and compromised bride and all the complexity of her story, but God is not done with her. There's actually a war coming, and through the woman, God is going to crush the head of the serpent that we will meet next week. And do you know what God is going to do? He's going to transform the queen of this world into his queen. She's so beautiful on the outside, but God is also going to make her beautiful on the inside. He's going to transform that victimization into redemption. He's going to transform that cowardice into courage. He's going to transform any compromise into consecration because Esther becomes extraordinary. And if her story is ours, then why would God want to do any less with you? So if you've been victimized by this world, God is not done with you. If you've been cowardly against evil, God is not done with you. If you've sold out for some personal gain, God is not done with you because he's the God that chooses the complicated and compromised bride. And so this morning, as we end chapter two, I leave you with a challenge. I challenge you to really ask yourself some hard questions and ask God to reveal the difficult answers. In what ways have you been compromised by the values of this world? And why start there? Because don't you know what your hidden God is doing right now? He's the king who is gathering those who are so beautiful to him from every province and every corner of this earth. He's gathering them, taking them, and bringing them unto himself and unifying them together into one bride in all of her complication and compromise and in all the complexity of her misplaced desires and broken pasts. And he's washing her clean. He's teaching her to let go of her idols. He's healing her wounds. He's beautifying her with his promises. This king is taking the harlot queen and transforming her into the queen of heaven. And together they will trample on the head of the serpent. And together, they will enter not into a one-night stand, but into a new day in which night will stand no more. And he will wipe away the tears from her eyes. So the story boils down to a simple invitation. The story invites you to bring the complexity of who and what you are to your king. Because it's the same place he met Esther. And it's the same place that he'll meet you. For the glory of Christ and the life of the world. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would You would reveal to us the ways in which we are so compromised and our hearts want so many different things. We ask that you would come to us and wash us clean, make us new, that you would whisper your promises into our ear, that you would change our hearts to love you, 
you would change our eyes to be able to see you. We ask that you would bring healing. We ask that you would bring renewal. We ask that you would bring repentance. And we ask that you would bring us new life. We thank you for this story and the ways it reminds us of the unending measure of your mercy and your grace and how you choose such a complicated people to be your bride. We confess our complication. We confess it as we come to your table that points forward to that wedding feast that we long to eat together, finally and fully. We ask that you would meet us there as we come to eat and drink with you. We ask all this in your precious name. Amen.